First week in Channel. Tonight on Watch Without Mother, we take a little trip into the world of retro animation. Laid back cloth cat Bagpuss discovers that there's no such thing as a tartan frog. Then in Eye for the Engine, we find why Mr. Jones has taken to wearing ladies' hats. Next, we flash back to the magic roundabout. Dougal eats some mushrooms and comes over all peculiar, and the iron chickens got the munchies in the clangers. Are you sitting comfortably? Then let's begin. Once upon a time, not so long ago, there was a little girl and her name was Emily. I got into being Emily from Bagpuss, I suppose, because I was um, the youngest of six children, um, being about seven at the time and I went shopping with my mother and bought some very strange Victorian looking stews. My mother made me um, a sort of Laura Ashley peasant type dress and I ended up being Emily from Bagpuss. Emily's cat, Bagpuss. The most important, the most beautiful, the most magical, saggy old cloth cat in the whole wide world. My father's studio was a cow shed and I think Oliver's was originally a pigsty which is now a stable. Um, I came home from school at about three o'clock and usually my mum would make a cup of tea and I'd take it out to Oliver and have to knock on the uh, door just in case he was in the process of filming and you'd hear very strange noises coming through the walls. <laughs> impossible, impossible, I don't think it. it isn't true. I think there is this sense, you know, with, with Bagpuss, of it being the creation of these two people. Uh, you know, perhaps long hours and strangeness that comes of two grown men hanging around with each other all day. And, you know, a sort of truly eccentric setup define the kind of brilliance of the thing that you create. Looks like a fish. No, it's a dolphin. If you were a mighty dolphin, you would find it quite revolting if you grew a pair of flappy ears. <laughs> the, the music is fantastic because, for a start, you know, what genius to actually use kind of this kind of eerie old folk songs just kind of plumbed from, from like this kind of archive from years back. <laughs> and as I understand it, I think. Um, the kind of episodes were put together in conjunction uh, with uh, Sandra Kerr and John Faulkner, who would add suggestions depending on what songs they knew and so forth. Of course! There was an old woman tossed up in a basket Ninety times as high as the moon Where she was going I couldn't but ask it For in her hand she carried a broom we played um, traditional instruments from the British Isles and from America and so on. And of course, one of these instruments was the most important for the series because it woke Bagpuss up and put him to sleep. And it was my auto harp, the Appalachian auto harp. And it looks like this. And um, to make the sound for Bagpuss waking up, all I did was sweep my thumb across all of the strings an immediate nostalgia sets in. And Bagpuss was wide awake. Oliver decided he would include John Faulkner as Gabriel the Frog, and I would be the bossy rag doll Madeline. Perfect typecasting, my friends always say to me. That will do. That is quite enough banging and smashing and playing about. Oh, yeah, obviously everyone loves Bagpuss because, you know, he's just such a, such a mellow, lovely kind of sort of, sort of laid-back patriarch. But I think it has to be the mice, really. They're kind of like a Greek chorus, aren't they? And they undercut Professor Yaffle's pomposity very well. No, no, no. 
newt, newt, newt. The mice are just adorable. They're such fun. I love listening to them and remembering what fun we had it had doing them, making those voices. So we had to sing things like, We will wash it, we will splash it. We will polish his toe, toe, toe. We will mend him, we will tend him. We will straighten his nose, nose, nose. We will wash it, we will splash it. We will polish his toe, toe, toe. We will polish his toe, toe, toe. I think Yaffle is fantastic, the way he's carved and, you know, he's just an amazing piece of work. And Gabriel's fantastic, but I'm not that keen on Madeleine. I don't know why, but I think Bagpuss would have to be my ultimate favourite, really. Well, that's very kind of you. I think the programmes have stood the test of time because, at the end of the day, they are just wonderful stories and a good story will always last. Um, they're not only wonderful, stories, they're beautifully crafted, they're told in that wonderful voice of Oliver's that's just kind of cream, just pure cream, it's lovely. One day Emily found a thing. And she brought it back to the shop and put it down in front of Bagpuss, who was in the shop window, fast asleep as usual. They're immensely kind of topical in the sense that their whole philosophy of reuse and recycle um, it's just the order of the day now. I mean, then it was quite something special, you know, and new and so on. I think there's something about Bagpuss um, in particular, which um, is just even to this day is the kind of equivalent of just having a very large dummy slipped in your mouth and kind of, you know, it's back to bedtime stories. The last time I saw that bucket, it was in the far west of Ireland, I think. I think. Yes, the far west of Ireland in a peat bog. There were only ever 13 episodes made, um, which is extraordinary because people assume that there were hundreds because they were repeated and repeated and repeated, but that's all there were, 13. I think my favourite episode would be have to be uh, the Hamish, which is about a, um, a bagpipe that goes in search of his friends. He can hear his friends in the background and... Um, I love the silhouettes in, and the animation in that and I think it's one of my favourites just because it's sort of um, endearing and sentimental really. Once upon a time, not so long ago, there was a little girl and her name was Emily. And she had a shop. There it is. It was rather an unusual shop because it didn't sell anything. You see, Everything in that shop window was a thing that somebody had once lost and Emily had found and brought home to Bagpuss. Emily's cat, Bagpuss. The most important, the most beautiful, the most magical, saggy old cloth cat in the whole wide world. Well now, one day Emily found a thing. And she brought it back to the shop and put it down in front of Bagpuss, who was in the shop window, fast asleep as usual. But then Emily said some magic words. Bagpuss, dear Bagpuss, old fat furry catpuss, wake up and look at this thing that I bring. Wake up, be bright, be golden and light. Bagpuss, oh hear what I sing. Bagpuss was wide awake. And when Bagpuss wakes up, all his friends wake up too. The mice on the mouse organ woke up and stretched. Mouse.
Madeleine, the rag doll. Gabriel, the toad. Look, look. Last of all, Professor Yaffle, who is a very distinguished old woodpecker. He climbed down off his bookend and went to see what it was that Emily had brought. soggy-looking thing. It's a dirty old sort of bag with legs made of tartan cloth. I haven't the slightest idea of what it is. I really don't know why Miss Emily brings us things like this. So we can mend them, of course. Clean them and restore them into the beautiful things they once were. Yep, yep, that's all very well. But we don't know what it once was. Well, we can try and think of things it might have been. Gabriel, what do you think? It looks a bit froggish, but it has a tartan coat. Is it a Scottish frog? No. Frogs have different sort of legs. And anyway, Scottish frogs are green or brownish, just like frogs anywhere else. I've never seen a tartan frog. Bagpuss, you are good at thinking. If this isn't a Scottish frog, what is it? Oh, oh, that's difficult. I shall need a thinking cap. Here's one. Will this do? Ah, a tartan thinking cap. A tam o -shanter. Oh, thank you. Let me see if I can think Scottish thoughts in a Scottish thinking cap. So Bagpuss thought. Oh, yes, I think I know what that is. I think that is a sort of small, soft Hamish. And what is a small, soft Hamish, if you please? Ah, it's an old story. A sad story from the highlands of Scotland, I will tell you. In the far north of Scotland, there once was a sort of creature who lived in lonely, cold, damp places. They kept away from people and lived alone because they were shy and rather frightened sort of creatures. In fact, they were completely unknown for many centuries and didn't even have a name until they were discovered by the famous Tavish McTavish. Now, Tavish McTavish lived all by himself in a tiny house high up in the mountains. He lived there not because he liked to live alone, but because he liked to play the bagpipes. He liked to play the bagpipes, but other people didn't like to listen to him playing the bagpipes, because he played them terribly badly. Anyway, one evening he was stamping up and down the shelf beside his house in the last of the twilight. He was stamping to keep his feet warm and blowing away at his bagpipes. It began to grow dark. He stopped playing and turned to go indoors. He heard a faint noise. It sounded, it sounded like, yes, it sounded like somebody playing the bagpipes. He listened delighted. The sound was terrible. There was only one person in the Highlands who played the bagpipes worse than he did, and that was his long-lost brother, Hamish McTavish. The sound came closer. In the dark, a small, humpy shape came towards him. He reached down and touched the shape, and said, thinking it was his long-lost brother, "'Tis very small ye are tonight, Hamish." He patted it and said, "'Tis very soft ye are tonight, Hamish." There was no answer. Tavish McTavish was feeling cold about the knees, and he said, "'You'll have had your tea then, Hamish." And as there was no reply, he led the way into his house. There, by the light of his oil lamp, he turned to greet his brother. They were both amazed at what they saw. Tavish McTavish was amazed because it wasn't his long-lost brother Hamish, but a small, soft creature. And the small, soft creature was amazed because he thought he had heard another small, soft creature, perhaps his own long-lost brother, crying for help in the cold winter twilight, and had come to help him. Well... Once they got over their surprise, they found they were rather pleased to see each other. McTavish made up the fire and closed the door, and they sat down. McTavish sat on a stool by the fire, hugging his cold knees, but the small, soft creature liked the cold, so it sat on the floor and leaned on the door, thus blocking up a rather nasty draught. Tavish McTavish called the creature Hamish in honour of his long-lost brother, and they lived there in the lonely house for a long time. They were very happy together for many years, 
And then, one evening, as they sat quietly by the fire, they heard a sound they recognized. Was it the distant sound of badly played bagpipes, or was it the distant crying of another soft Hamish? Tavish McTavish looked at his friend. He said, Is it my long-lost brother we hear playing a scuttle on the bagpipes? The soft Hamish shook its head. Is it your own long-lost brother calling you to come home? asked the Tavish. The soft Hamish nodded and looked very sad. Aye, you must go to your own folk, said McTavish. He rose to his feet, he opened the door, and he saw in the twilight a line of small soft Hamishes standing waiting for their long-lost brother. His own soft Hamish ran to join them, and they all walked away in line over the hill. The noise they made as they sang together was quite awful, but Tavish McTavish stood and listened until the last notes had died away in the distance. Then he went back into his little house. He picked up his bagpipes, but he didn't feel like playing them any more. Aye, he said, that's time to go to my own folk. He put on his boots, closed the door of his house, and... Tucking his bagpipes under his arm, he walked down to the village where he had been born. He went to live with his sister-in-law, Mavis McTavish. She was a strict lady and did not like the sound of bagpipes, and he never played them again. It's, it's a very sad story. Yet, 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 it's not only sad, it is silly. It's not only silly, it is not true. There's no such thing as a small, soft Hamish that makes noises like bagpipes. It is all nonsense. It's quite obvious what that thing is. It is a porcupine. A porcupine? Yes. A porcupine without any spikes. But there's no such thing. Porcupines have spikes. Well, uh, <laughs> maybe it lost them somewhere. What we need is a good song to encourage it to grow some new spikes. Went up in a balloon. He sailed it here, he sailed it there, he sailed it nearly everywhere, except perhaps the moon. He sailed with ease across the seas, an inch above the waves, and only jolt at getting salt. At which an ancient codfish croaked How nicely he behaved He sailed it rough with snarling tough While animals below He sailed it blind and tried to find Some gentle thing to live behind The sunset's rosy glow he sailed it hot above a lot of scorching desert sand. He sailed it cold, as I've been told, where crowds of happy penguins hold their slippers hand in hand. He sailed it high beyond the sky, and then I must explain. A spiky spine, a porcupine, popped his balloon so proud and fine, and brought it down again. <laughs> I must say, that doesn't seem to have had any effect on the poor thing. Well... I should have thought a song like that would, uh, would rather put it off growing spikes, not made it want to grow them. Of course, how silly we are. That thing is quite all right, just as it is. Yes, but what is it? Oh, it's a porcupine, all right. 
But it's meant to have no spikes. You add the spikes. It's a pincushion. A porcupine pincushion. No, a porcupine pine cushion. A pin. Pi no. A porcupine pincushion. <laughs> a porcupine cushion. That's what it is. All we need is pins. It is a perfect porcupine, por por porcupine pin cushion. The mice pulled it to the front of the window so that if anybody should happen to come past who had happened to lose a porcupine pin cushion, they would come in and collect it. And so their work was done. <sighs> Bagpuss gave a big yawn and settled down to sleep. And of course, when Bagpuss goes to sleep, all his friends go to sleep too. The mice were ornaments on the mouse organ. Gabriel and Madeleine were just dolls. And Professor Yaffle was a carved wooden bookend in the shape of a woodpecker. Even Bagpuss himself, once he was asleep, was just an old, saggy cloth cat. Baggy and a bit loose at the seams. But Emily loved him. Coming up in part two, Ida tackles the issue of fox hunting. The magic roundabout investigates the perils of communal living. And in the clangers, the iron chicken represents the selfish individualism of the free market when it scoffs the soup. on the coal tip at Grumbly Gasworks, delivering coal. When people look back at Ivor, um, they look back with, with charm, uh, uh, not irony. They don't go, oh my God, do you, do, 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 do you can imagine I really like that? Oh! But with Ivor, it's different. They say, oh yes, uh, it's like a little oasis. Well, it was a lovely day for an outing. Even though Ivor had quite a load to pull, he was feeling fine and full of steam as they rolled down towards the points below Tanagilch. Hey, go easy on the points there, Ivor. You know that, Dickie. I think in some ways I find it quite a kind of serene world, although it's quite a magical world and it's quite there's some quite unusual things going on in, you know, in what is a quiet sort of valley in Wales, you know, with dragons' eggs being hatched in Ivor's firebox and stray elephants, you know, needing their feet bandaged up. These sort of things kind of wouldn't really be happening. And so there is a there is a certain kind of um, magical side to the setting. Come out, dragons! Idris, Solwen, Guyan, Broadwen! Dragons! Oh, oh, dragons! The real thing! The characters that were written um, were so colourful. And sometimes you had to talk with yourself. And so it's either louder or softer. So, I mean, Daystation's Dice very lugubrious and easy. And then you've got Mr. D the, the gold miner, Mr. Dunwiddie. And I uh, saw so he put him very high, you see, so that uh, when you were talking about it, you, you would be able to differentiate between the characters. It's really as simple as that, but it was great fun. You're supposed to be a gold miner, not a bubble blower. See? Well, I don't know. 
I dig up all this gold, and then they just put it in the ground again. No, I reckon it's just as silly digging gold as blowing bubbles. Having known Oliver, I think Oliver's very aware of what a wicked old world we live in, and I know that he was in the forefront of nuclear disarmament and this, that, and the other. So I think he, he, he softened that, that edge. Certainly not escape. He probably could be escapism. Why not? In, into a lovely, a, a gentle world of decency and um, uh, charm. Oh, 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 I, I, I didn't see you there, Miss Price. I, I beg your... Oh, 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 oh. Although Postgate has got quite strong political views, and I think you can see those coming through in the writing, like um, Ivor and um, Ivor and Jones, you know, save foxes from the hunt, and um, there's a kind of strong sense of sort of heroics, I think, quiet sort of Welsh heroics in, um, in, in their relationship and in their adventures. There he is, up in the wood by Mrs. Porty's house. What's he doing there, I wonder? Oh, there's Jones the steam, and Mrs. Porty. What are they looking at? Oh, foxes. There they are, Mr. Jones. Three lovely cubs she's got, haven't you, Mrs. Fox? Oh, yes, and she's proud of them, too, you can tell. Well, I only hope the fox hunters keep away. They've been out a lot lately. Oh, time to go. Ivor has seen Di at the station. All right, I'm coming. Oh, Mr. Jones, if you're down at the station, you might see if my hat has come. It's for the Institute prize giving tomorrow. It's a lovely hat, all feathers and high, with a veil and a... Oh, yeah, yes, well, I, I'll see if it's there. You just look after those foxes, Mrs. Porty. Oh. Oh, there you are, Jones. Where have you been? Has this hat box come for Mrs. Porty? Very urgent, it says. Handle with care. Oh, I know. It's a lovely hat, too. It's all feathers and high with a veil and a sort yes, of... Yes, all right, I dare say, but you'd better get over there and deliver it or she'll be on the telephone. That's where we've just been. There's three lovely fox cubs in her wood. Oh, nature study, is it? Well, those foxes had better look out. The hunt is somewhere about today. Oh, don't talk about it, Di. Come on, Ivor. Oh. Hi, hold on, Ivor. What's going on over there? Oh, look at that, the hunt. And they're up by Mrs. Porty's. Oh, look, there's a fox. And they're after her. She's heading for the bridge. Oh, perhaps she'll see us there. Come on. She's seen us. Ready with the steam. Here she comes. <laughs> I say, Railmaywen, do you have to make so much steam? Oh, just blowing off the pipes a bit, you know. What an ass that you've got on your head. Oh, that's for the Institute prize giving. It's a lovely hat, look, it's all feathers. Yes, I'm sure it's, it's, it's a charming hat, old boy, but we've lost a fox. You don't happen to have seen a fox, do you? Oh, yes, I, I did see a fox, but I don't reckon it wanted to see you. Good morning, gentlemen. <laughs> Extraordinary sort of chap. Oh, well, come on, Carrara. Hang on while I change the points, Ivor. Oh, good morning, Mr. Jones. I didn't recognize you in your new hat. Very pretty. You too. Oh, that's not mine. That's Mrs. Porty's. Well, you better be careful of it, Mr. Jones. 
it for you to deliver in its pretty box, not to wear and get it blown to pieces. What are you wearing it for, anyway? Oh, you'd laugh if I told you, Mrs. Williams. I bet Mrs. Portney won't laugh when she sees her new hat. Mr. Jones, you are wearing my new hat. Oh, now, Mrs. Portney, don't jump to conclusions. Wait while I explain what happened. Where is your hat? Well, it was the hunt, you see, and there was nowhere else she could go, and my hat doesn't spoil so easily, so I left that inside, and I thought you'd rather, uh, in the circumstances. Mrs. Fox. You see? Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Jones. What else could you do? And the hat will be perfectly all right, with a bit of tidying up, I think. <laughs> Oliver was no dictatorial producer. He'd, 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 he'd be like the leader of a trio, and we'd actually work the voices out one to another and discard things. I mean, there must have been some wonderful characters to discard if, But those that worked and balanced, if you're talking one with another, would, would, uh, would be the ones that were chosen. And it's a two-man thing. I mean, you've got Oliver and Peter working together, and that comes across. You don't get the corporate feeling, do you? Miss Price, 21 Wellington Drive, Van Gobbin. She's my... Uh... Betrothed. We are to be married. But meanwhile, I send her a little love letter every day by pigeon post. Well, today she received 28 love letters. That's right. A cornucopia of amorous protestations. We're still living in tremendously visual times. But this is a kind of homespun. You've got the smell of this homespun. Uh, piece, and even though you're unaware of it, it's, it's, uh, that must be an element of the charm. It could be twee, but it misses that. I uh, accidentally released a number of pigeons belonging to Mr. Brangwyn. Oh, I wondered what had happened. I thought Mr. Brangwyn was being exceptionally passionate. I've always got such a strong personality for, you know, for an engine that just kind of pipes away, but everyone talks to him and... Jones, the steam, and Ivor have, have quite a strong friendship. And Ivor, you know, is quite obstinate and he, he wants to sing in the choir and everything else. And um, I think they're quite quiet, quiet sort of heroes together, really. Oh, oh, hey, hey, what's going on? Oh, Ivor, I've told you often enough, you mustn't jam your brakes on like that without warning. And it's never good over evil. I don't remember that. It's always people helping helping each other out. It's in so strange circumstances. Oh, they have been so kind. Looked after my Alice. Looked after me. Kept us warm with a special gasworks fire. Even the lion tamer in uh, Charlie Banger, Charlie Banger's circus. He's so um. Uh, Charlie Banger's upset because the lions aren't angry enough because the lions just love the lion tamer. <laughs> That's lovely, isn't it? Yeah, Gilvani, what's up with your wild, ferocious lions? I do my best, Mr. Banger, but they love me too much. My favourite episode was um, where die stations think that Martians are landing. <laughs> Ivor the engine. Look, there he is at Laniog Station. I suppose there's not a lot to do today or he'll be off somewhere with his little flat truck. I wonder where Jones the Steam and Dice Station are. Oh, sitting in deck chairs on the platform, look, having a cup of tea. There's luxury now. You know, I wonder sometimes, Di, looking up in the sky about, uh, well, you know, life on other planets and that. Oh, yes. There is. I got a book about it. Little green men with pointed heads there. Oh, don't be daft, I. No, it's true. They come over in flying saucers. When they land, they look like petrol pumps and say, take me to your leader. <laughs> Never. Yes, I've seen one. There's a lot about nowadays. Look, there's one now. What, a little green man? No, a flying saucer, silly. The little green men are inside. Oh, look at that. There are half a dozen more up there. 
It must be some sort of invasion. They seem to be coming across over Dinwiddie's pit. Oh. oh, let's go up there and look. Oh, I want to know what's going on. Come on, Di. Oh, look. There's a lot of them over Dinwiddie's pit. Oh, I reckon you are right, Jones. That is an invasion. Well, look, let's be careful. We'll stop behind the hill and climb up to see it from above. Good thinking, Edwin Jones. Hey, listen to that. I never heard anything like that before. I can hear it in with his voice inside it. Listen. Sounds like he is part of the noise. Oh, they're torturing him, I reckon. Oh, I don't like that. No, I'm not standing for that. No, no, no. It's all right, Mr. Dinwiddie. I will save you. Mr. Dinwiddie. Maragas, are you all right? Are you looking for me? Oh, there you are. I thought the Martians had captured you. Captured me? Martians? Yes, in those flying saucers. Flying saucers? There's little green men with pointed heads inside them. Look! <laughs> oh, it... It's nothing to laugh at. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I'm so sorry. Just my joke. Oh, dear. Is he all right, do you reckon? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm all right. Look, I must show you something. Look. You see this lever here? And, and this blower from the old smelting oven? Well, I swing on the lever like this and... There you are! Up it goes! A perfect soap bubble! Look at that! Silly, I call it. Wasting time like that. Blowing bubbles all day. You're supposed to be a gold miner, not a bubble blower. Silly? Well, I don't know. I dig up all this gold, and then they just put it in the ground again. No, I reckon it's just as silly digging gold as blowing bubbles. Only blowing bubbles is easier and more fun. Find out now. Very good, yes. That's a good one. Hey, may I have a go? Certainly. Oh, oh. Hold tight then. How about that? Hey, hey, what about steam power, Mr. Dinwiddie? Oh, yes. <laughs> they connected a hose pipe to Ivor's boiler, and then they made bubbles. Tonight on Watch Without Mother, we give you the moon and the stars. The stars of Magic Roundabout, glimpsed in one of the first ever episodes. And the first creatures on the moon, the Clangers. Neil Armstrong, eat your heart out. It was uh, fantastic music, wasn't it? Very uh, um, haunting. In fact, I had the um, the theme tune, uh, da, 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 which actually was a bit faster than I always remembered. I always remembered it quite slowly, but actually it's quite perky when you listen to it on the tapes. I had that for my, um, when I walked down the uh, aisle when I got married. <laughs> My dad was Eric Thompson and he 
What happened was he did quite a lot of children's telly and there was a lady called Joy Whitby who worked at the BBC at that time and she got sent these tapes from France that had been made by this Serge Dano chap and she thought she'd run them by my dad, see what he thought. So he did a pilot for her. He renamed all the characters and just did his own story and she liked it and it went on from there. He looked at the roundabout and he looked at Mr Rusty. Right he said. Let's see what these horses are like. Oh dear, said the horse. Zebedee was here, there and everywhere and Mr Rusty couldn't keep up with him. I have a, a conscious memory of, of him doing them in his study. He had a little reel-to-reel, -reel, an old reel-to-reel -reel machine and um, you know the big fat reel here and a big fat reel here and the tape and um, this is all very high-tech. And uh, there was a little, just a one button, it went um, forward, stop, back, stop. That was the extent of the technology. It was fantastic. And um, that's the sort of technology I, 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 I could understand in place. And um, so occasionally I used to sit there and he'd sit there just with a big A4 pad and he'd watch the stories and he'd be able to go, well, stop. And you'd go to the middle bit, that was stop. And he'd, and he'd go back, right, stop. Forward, stop. So, you know, you could be a little assistant for a while as he sat there just scribbling away the stories. Let's clean up first, said Zebedee suddenly. Oh, yes, yes, let's clean up first, said Mr Rusty nervously. You make sure everything works, said Zebedee. Uh, yes, yes, I'll make sure everything works, said Mr Rusty. During the 90s and into the year 2000, there's a lot of uh, children's programmes that the parents don't really like the children to watch. Maybe they're too violent or... And this is going back to traditional children's classic television. Do go, called Florence. Hello. Oh, there you are. How are you feeling today? Any better? Not very well, as it happens, said Dougal. I think I'm ill. I've got a sore throat. Well, you can probably hear that. Uh... At the studios, we sculpt and we produce and hand paint classic children's characters. My personal favourite collection wise is the Magic Roundabout. That was the first collection that was sculpted and probably from that collection um, it's, it's Ermintrude. Ermintrude the cow. She's always been one of my favourites. All I know is that Ermintrude was I don't think it exactly was my mum, but it was a collation of all his Scottish relatives, I think, uh, my mum <laughs> included. And she, uh, her mum was quite barking, and, and, she, and she had five extraordinary Scottish aunts. And I think that, um, I think um, was was a bit of a collation of all those wonderful women. Well, it all looks a bit samey to me, said Ermintrude, who was probably just a teeny weeny little bit jealous. I think Dylan was very attractive to me because he seemed like a kind of a sort of proto sort of hippie kind of fonz really. He seemed to be like everyone used to pay attention when he was around um, and I think at least I did anyway. Um, I think I wanted to be a lot like Dylan. Hello Dylan, said Florence. Ah, a garden gnome, said Dougal. Hey wow, said Dylan, waking up. Mushrooms, they must have sprung up overnight. <sighs> Dougal and Brian's relationship is is so fantastic <laughs> and so robust and Dougal's so very rude and Brian's so very perky and doesn't doesn't take umbrage. He takes all these insults and bounces back. I'd, I'd like to be a bit like him. Hello, twits, said Dougal. Hello, Dougal, said the twits. Isn't it a lovely outdoorsy day? All springy and outdoorsy. It is unless you get hay fever, said Dougal. Hello, everyone, said Florence. Hello, Florence, said the twits. We were just saying how lovely and outdoorsy and springy it is today. Yes, it is nice, said Florence. Unless you get hay fever, said Dougal. Oh, the smells of spring, as our auntie used to say, the blooming flowers and the smell of freshly cut grass. Freshly cut grass? Where? 
said Dougal. Yes, and the lovely pussy willow on the wind, and the... Oops. Come on, Dougal, said Florence. It always makes us feel like flapping our wings, doesn't it? Oh, yes, it does. Just like our auntie, flitting about in the trees on the scented breeze. Well, it just gives me a runny nose and sore eyes and a dry throat, said Dougal. And it makes me want to... Uh, 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 well, sneeze, actually, but I think I'm managing to keep it under control. Achoo! Achoo! Oh, dear. Oh, dear, you poor thing, said the twits. Yes, you poor thing. Oh, you've got an allergy. He's got an allergy, hasn't he? We'd better take you to the doctor. We'll soon have you sorted out. Oh, yes, the doctor will soon have you sorted out. Here we are. What seems to be the problem? Our doggy friend here seems to be suffering from hay fever, doesn't he? Yes, he does. He's suffering from hay fever. Yes, said Florence. He's been sneezing. Right, said the doctor. Let's have a look at you, then. Hmm. Yes. And I've got a runny nose and sore eyes, said Dougal. Well, all these things are stress-related these days, you know. You're probably imagining it. What you need is relaxation, something to take your mind off it. Have you ever tried hypnotherapy? What? said Dougal. I don't know, said Florence. Maybe he's right. Oh, yes, said the twits. Our auntie tried a hypnotist for a bad wing, didn't she? Alternative medicine, said Dougal. Well, why not give it a try? It's very soothing. Just relax. Breathe deep. You feel drowsy and sleepy. Relax. It's easy. Easy peasy wheezy. Easy peasy. Easy peasy pie. Count to ten. Let it all go and then. Just imagine you're as light as a feather being blown on the gentle breeze. Hmm. Well, the earth didn't move for me, said Dougal. It was very pleasant, though, said Florence. Enough of all this nonsense. What you need is lots of exercise, regular meals, and plenty of rest. Oh, look, it's the flying second opinion, said Dougal. Who asked you? No, no, no. Dr Peacock is right. You need plenty of rest. That's what our auntie always used to say. Couldn't I just have an aspirin, said Dougal? There, look, I've done my exercise. Here's our auntie's pillow that she made. Now you lie down and have a good night's rest on that. Yes. You lie down and have a good night's rest. Lovely. Hmm, said Dougal. A feather pillow, no doubt. Only the best for our auntie. It's lovely and soft, that pillow. Night, night, Dougal, said Florence. Yes, nighty, nighty, Dougaly Woogly, you poor little hay fevery thingy, you. Has Dougal got hay fever? said Zebedee. Yes, said Florence. And the doctor's told him to get some rest. Oh, said Zebedee, thoughtfully. Ignore it and it'll go away. That's what my auntie always used to say. So long, said Florence. If there's one thing I'm allergic to, said Dougal, it's... Uh, 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 it's doctors and aunties. Now, what shall I do with this? Hmm. There we are. Achoo! People have asked over the years, you know, whether, whether the weather any drug influence, uh, influences there, and, and actually they, were, they weren't at all. My dad was the most undruggy <laughs> person, um, so they, they absolutely weren't. Because it was uh, produced in the 60s, there always was uh, a drug culture feel to it. It's, it's never been proved or disproved, but there are some stories. I mean. Dylan could have been accused of growing something stronger than carrots in his vegetable patch. No, man, it's cool. I know how to handle these things, said Dylan, and fell asleep.
a lot of it has to do with the spirit of the times and I suppose you know if you have a kind of really spaced out character called Dylan um, who says man a lot you know that's that's I mean I suppose there is in that in that sense a kind of indirect kind of drug culture influence yes Dougal he was always um, as you know he, he lived on sugar and once he ate his sugar I think there was more than glucose in there that kept him going the way he did this is purely for medicinal purposes, you understand, said Dougal. And Zebedee, of course, he just boiled everywhere, so I, I presume he was on something else as well, I don't know. Hello, Mr Rusty, said Florence. Howdy doody, Florence, said Mr. Rusty, and what are you up to? I thought I might go and pick some wild flowers and herbs and things for my nature project. Good idea, said Zebedee. It could be very educational and quite enjoyable too, I hope, said Florence. Hello, Dougal, said Florence. Fancy going on a nature ramble. Hi there, hop pickers, said Mr. McHenry. Hello, Mr. McHenry, said Florence. So you're going on a hike? Yes, said Florence. Just the right kind of a day for picking mushrooms, said Mr. McHenry, but make sure you don't eat any. Oh, no, said Florence. Yes, they spring up overnight, you know, when the conditions are right. Oh, said Florence. We'll look out for that. Hmm, said Dougal. Well, there's none sprung up around here. Come on, Dougal, said Florence. Let's go and see if we can find some interesting things for my nature table. Mm, said Dougal. Mushrooms, yes. Now, which way do we go? Uh, this way, said Florence. Yes, said Dougal. I quite fancy some mushrooms, sliced up and fried in butter, have them on toast, or stirred into a creamy sauce with spaghetti. Oh, look, said Florence. That's interesting. Is it, said Dougal. Or we could always put them with some melted cheese and a squeeze of tomato puree on bread. Have a sort of homemade mushroom pizza. No, said Florence, we're not going to eat them. We're going to look at them under microscopes and things. <coughs> Hello, Dylan, said Florence. Ah, a garden gnome, said Dougal. Hey, wow, said Dylan, waking up. Mushrooms. They must have sprung up overnight. <sighs> Either that or fallen from the sky. Oh, look, it speaks, said Dougal. Mm hmm? Now, Dougal, don't eat any of them, will you, said Florence. Why not, said Dougal. Uh, time to move on, said Dylan. Sometimes I think that rabbit would make a good specimen on a nature table, said Dougal. You can't eat them because we don't know which ones are poisonous, said Florence. I'd just have a little nibble. Be all right, wouldn't it, said Dougal. No, Dougal, said Florence. This is a scientific experiment. Ooh! What on earth, said Dougal. Oh, look, it got bigger, said Florence. I can see that, said Dougal. There's enough for a casserole there. I wonder if they're all like that, said Florence, picking another mushroom. Oh, oh, yes, look. Careful, said Dougal. I don't like the look of this. These mushrooms must be magic. Do you think so, said Florence? Oh, look, it's turned into a little umbrella. What's it playing at now, treacherous toadstool? Ooh. Oh, oh, watch out, said Dougal. That's a poisonous parasol. It's got spots on the top. Oh, look, said Florence. It's got bigger again. Philandering fungus, said Dougal, who was a bit scared. I've always wanted one of these, said Florence. Oh. Oh, wow, the temperature's rising, said Dylan, and went off to look for some shade. Dylan, called Florence. Yeah, said Dylan, sleepily. Be careful, said Dougal. She's picked a Parasolicus Botanicus. There you are, said Florence. Try this. Thank you, said Dylan. Now this is cool. Of course, you know what's going to happen if they keep getting bigger, don't you, said Zebedee. No, said Florence. There won't be mushroom for anything else. <laughs> what an absolutely pathetic joke, said Dougal. 
Well, it was only a matter of time before someone said it, said Florence. Just glad it wasn't me. Coming up in the last part on Watch Without Mother, we prepared a gourmet treat. Get your taste buds ready for blue string soup and an enormous egg in the clangers. to shop in Red Hill where I lived in Surrey and uh, getting my mum to buy me a swanny whistle so I could do clanging noises. Ah, Major Clanger doesn't mind about the broken net. He has made another flying machine. The music was uh, one of the main important things. It was a uh, very eerie sort of folk based. Um, a lot of it sounds quite at least in European. first time I've ever heard those sounds and so it's been sort of quite a big influence on the songs I write I suppose. What a great pile of song! Look at that! I love the clangers and my favourite characters out of the clangers are the froglets and the sky moos and I do remember being allowed to play with the sky moos and just absolutely loving the fact that you could move their ears and their ears made the whole of the big ear move around. And I think the clangers definitely are my favourite out of everything. This planet, this cloudy planet, is the Earth. It is our home, the place where you and I live. But supposing we look away from the Earth and travel, in our imaginations, across the vast, endless stretches of outer space. There we can imagine other stars, stranger stars by far than ever shone in our night sky, and other stranger people too. People, perhaps, with civilization, skill and efficiency may be far in advance of ours. Major Clanger, ready to start the countdown. I wonder what sort of rocket it is. That was the best sort of rocket, a sky rocket full of stars. And of course they want to let off another one.
That one hit something. Look out. What's an extraordinary lot of objects? Well, the only thing to do is to carry them below and try to fit them together again. If there's one thing that clangers are really good at, it's putting together bits of machinery. There, it's all done. I wonder what it is. It looks like a sort of chicken. Very peculiar. It's an iron chicken. <laughs> and a very polite iron chicken it is too. And so it says goodbye and walks away. And it's nearly time for Small Clanger and Tiny Clanger to fetch the soup for the Clanger's tea. And there go Small Clanger and Tiny Clanger on their trolley. Off to the soup wells to fetch a jug of soup. What have they seen? Oh, it mustn't do that. It's eating the copper trees. That's not allowed. They must tell the soup dragon. out of the soup. It mustn't do that. <laughs> and it just walks away again. Whatever will it do next? It's walking through the wall. It walks straight through the wall. Oh, yes, don't forget the soup. And home they go to tell Mother Clanger what they have seen. I wonder if she will believe them. Find out. The roof is breaking. Find out. Look at that. The iron chicken is eating her tea. She seems to be enjoying it too, but I don't think Major Clanger will be pleased. Oh 
dear, now she's upset. She's going broody. Well, she doesn't understand. Somebody should be friendly and explain things to her. Yes, Tiny Clanger will do it. And she's brought her a present. for Tiny Clanger. Spiky nest somewhere in the sky. I like the story that apparently they, um, when it was shown to like German TV company, uh, without um, Oliver Postcode's voice over the top. Uh, they just assumed that the people were like the clangers' voices were in German, except you know, wordless German. And uh, then they took the tapes to Sweden, the same thing happened. <laughs> It's funny, really, because the clangers kind of makes me nostalgic for for things being on the moon, um, which is kind of odd because you know you associate all that sort of stuff with the future. All set. Ready? Contact! And away he goes. Good luck, Major Clanger. I think Oliver Postgate's voiceover on the Clangers is uh, a sort of ideal dad voice. And I've, I've got a friend who um, has, uh, tried to cultivate his voice to sound like Oliver Postgate so when he talks to his kids. It's broken. Look, the notes have come adrift. Poor Tiny Clanger is floating in space. When I came home from school, we'd all go out into Oliver's studio and watch the screenings of um, things when they'd just come back from the developers. That was absolutely fantastic, you know, seeing that all sitting in uh, Oliver's studio in the dark and having our own screenings of it. This is the planet Earth, our home place where we live. We can stand on our earth and look out to the vast empty sky and see millions of stars shining like bright dots. And in between the stars, just empty space. But is it empty? We can imagine strange stars in the sky. Perhaps we can also imagine other things too, unknown objects too small to see from here, hurtling about in the space between the stars. What would they be like? Who knows? But perhaps some enterprising fisherman could sail his boat across this vast endless sea and cast his rod and line to catch some very unusual fish. And there is small clanger in their musical boat. He's fishing. Miss. Something else. He's caught it. Very odd. Looks like a top hat.
something in it. Come on out, little thing. Come on out. of them out of one hat. <laughs> They're sort of froglet things, aren't they? How extraordinary. There's Mother Clanger setting the tablecloth. There they are again. How odd. They're going into the bed caves. Mother Clanger won't like that. Come on out of there. <whistles> you know, I think those froglets are just making fun of Mother Clanger. seen them all right. They're right next to you. Or well, they were a minute ago. Poor Mother Clanger. She's quite put out by all this disturbance. Oh, soup. Oh yes, it's soup time. Time to fetch soup from the soup wells. Here comes Tiny Clanger. She seems to be very worried about something. Perhaps she's seen them too. A well, small clanger is coming. Oh dear, the froglets. They don't look at all well. Can they do? Oh yes, that's right. Put them on the trolley and take them to the soup wells. The soup dragon will know what to do about them. Ah, yes, perhaps some hot soup would do them good. Yes, this will revive them. There we are. Oh. oh. Well, Major Clanger didn't stay very long. Poor froglets. They are still not at all well. They must do something. Of course, put them back in the hat. They won't go in. They all came out of the hat, but now they won't go back in it again. Ah, yes. It's 
Rather special soup. Blue and white pudding soup. Very nourishing. Yes! Yes! Yes, that seems to have done the trick. And now they want some more. There isn't any more. If they want more, somebody must fetch it from the pudding soup wells. Small Clanger will fetch it if the soup dragon tells him exactly how to find the way. Very complicated directions. I hope he'll be able to find the way. Now, which way was it? Very odd. Those caves seem to be a bit crooked. Now, which way? Through there, was it? Yes, another froglet. <laughs> 